I was just 26 years old when first elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses, and there took my first effort to bring slavery to an end. And late in life, I wrote of that experience in my autobiography. In 1769, I became a member of the legislature by the choice of the county in which I live and continued in that until it was closed by the revolution. I made one effort in that body for the permission of the emancipation of slaves, which was rejected. And indeed, during the regal government, nothing liberal could expect success. Two years before drafting our Declaration of Independence, I wrote a much longer paper detailing the offenses of the King of England against his colonies. That paper came to be known as a summary view of the rights of British America, and among its subjects I addressed the issue of slavery. The abolition of domestic slavery is the great object of desire in those colonies where it was unhappily introduced in their infant state. But previous to the enfranchisement of the slaves we have, it is necessary to exclude all further importations from Africa. Yet our repeated attempts to effect this have been hitherto defeated by His Majesty's negative thus preferring the advantages of a few African corsairs to the lasting interests of the American states and to the rights of human nature, deeply wounded by this infamous practice. In the year before I gained the presidency, I wrote to Elbridge Gerry about economy in the national government as follows. I am for a government rigorously frugal and simple, applying all the possible savings of the public revenue to the discharge of the national debt and not for a multiplication of officers and salaries. In 1770, I defended pro bono a slave named Samuel Howells, who was suing for his freedom. And in papers prepared in his defense, I wrote, Under the law of nature, all men are born free. Everyone comes into the world with a right to his own person, which includes the liberty of moving and using it at his own will. This is what is called personal liberty and is given to him by the author of nature because necessary for his own sustenance. Well into my retirement, I wrote to Edward Coles in 1814 about my decades-long desire to see slavery be brought to an end in the United States. My views on the subject of the slavery of Negroes has long since been in the possession of the public, and time has only served to give them stronger root. The love of justice and the love of country plead equally for the cause of these people, and it is a mortal approach to us that they have pleaded for it so long in vain, and should have produced not a single effort. Nay, I fear not much serious willingness to relieve them and ourselves from our present condition of moral and political reprobation. In my first inaugural address, delivered on the fourth day of March, 181, I summed up the role of good government as follows. A wise and frugal government, which shall leave men free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. Regarding the enterprise that we had embarked upon in America, I wrote to David Hartley in 1787, I have no fear that the result of our experiment will be that men may be trusted to govern themselves without a master. About the example that I hoped that America would be to the world, I wrote to Tench Cox in June of 1795, this ball of liberty, 
I believe most piously, is now so well in motion that it will roll around the globe, or at least that enlightened part of it, for light and liberty go together. It is our glory that we were first to put it in motion, and our happiness that being foremost, we had no bad examples to follow. Very late in life, 1825, I wrote about our founding document to Henry Lee. This was the object of the Declaration of Independence, not to find out new principles or new arguments, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent, and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, it was intended to be an expression of the American mind. About books and their value in society, I wrote to my old friend and fellow laborer James Madison when we were both years retired from the national government. Books constitute capital. A library book lasts as long as a house, for hundreds of years. It is not, then, an article of mere consumption, but fairly of capital. And often, in the case of professional men setting out in life, it is their only capital. When I gained the presidency, the nation's finances were incomprehensible. And in the next year, 1802, I wrote to Albert Gallatin, my Secretary of the Treasury, I think it is an object of great importance to simplify our system of finance and bring it within the comprehension of every member of Congress. We might hope to see the finances of the Union as clear and as intelligible as a merchant's books, so that every member of Congress and every man of any mind in the Union should be able to comprehend them to investigate abuses and consequently to control them. In my autobiography, written in 1821, I was 78, I wrote about the public's unwillingness to end the slavery in our states. It was found that the public mind would not yet bear the proposition, nor will it bear it even at this day, Yet the day is not distant when it must bear and adopt it, or worse will follow. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. I wrote about our enslaved population in my autobiography in 1821. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. As America's ambassador to France, I wrote to George Gilmore in 1787, three years removed from my beloved home in Virginia. All my wishes end, where I hope my days will end, at Monticello, too many scenes of happiness mingle themselves with all the recollections of my native woods and fields to suffer them to be supplanted in my affection by any other. I described my home to Maria Causeway in 1786 and our own dear Monticello. Where has nature spread so rich a mantle under the eye? Mountains forests, rocks, rivers, with what majesty do we there ride above the clouds? How sublime to look down into the workhouse of nature, to see her clouds, hail, snow, rain, thunder, all fabricated at our feet, and the glorious sun when rising as if out of a distant water, just gilding the tops of the mountains and giving life to all nature. 
I was President Washington's Secretary of State when I wrote to Joseph Fay in 1793 about how I wanted to conduct myself as a public man, keeping myself anchored in the soil. When I first entered on the stage of public life, now 24 years ago, I came to a resolution never to engage while in public office in any kind of enterprise for the improvement of my fortune, nor to wear any other character than that of a farmer. I have never departed from it in a single instance. I loved farming and farms and farmers. And in 1785, I wrote to John Jay about the latter, cultivators of the earth are the most valuable citizens. They are the most vigorous, the most independent, the most virtuous, and they are tied to their country and wedded to its liberty and interests by the most lasting bands. I am still devoted to the garden. Though but an old man, I am but a young gardener. I denied the public accusations against me that arose early in my presidency about improper conduct toward one of my servants. I did so by admitting to a previous indiscretion some 35 years earlier when I wrote to Robert Smith, my Secretary of the Navy in 1805, I plead guilty to one of their charges, that when young and single, I offered love to a handsome lady. I acknowledge its incorrectness. It is the only one founded in truth among all of their allegations against me. Near the very end of my life, on the 15th day of May, 1826, I would write to Henry Lee, there is not a truth existing which I fear or would wish unknown to the entire world. Just several months before gaining the presidency, I wrote to my old friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, about the importance of intellectual freedom. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. To Henry Lee, I would write late in life, May of 1826, all should be laid open to you without reserve, for there is not a truth which I fear or would wish unknown to the entire world. I devoted the last dozen years of my life to the establishment of the University of Virginia. And of it, I wrote to William Roscoe in 1820, this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here, we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error, so long as reason is left free to combat it. We are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error, so long as reason is left free to combat it. Late in life, I wrote the epitaph that was to appear upon my tombstone. I wanted recorded there the three things for which I wished to be remembered, those three and no more. And in an undated memorandum written late in life, I wrote as follows. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute in Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. I was greatly concerned about the expanded role that our federal courts had taken upon themselves. And I wrote to Mr. Correy in 1823, at the establishment of our constitutions, the judiciary bodies were supposed to be the most helpless and harmless members of the government. Experience, however, soon showed in what way they were to become the most dangerous, sapping by little and little the foundations of the Constitution. As a younger man, 
I studied the various competing claims of the different religions of the world and wrote to James Fishback about that study shortly after retiring from the presidency. At an earlier period of life, I pursued inquiries of that kind with industry and care. Reading and reflection and time have convinced me that the interests of society require the observation of those moral precepts only in which all religions agree. For all forbid us to murder, steal, plunder, or bear false witness, and that we should not intermeddle with the particular dogmas in which all religions differ, and which are totally unconnected with morality. For my personal and private devotions, I prepared a small volume for myself, drawn from the Gospels, and I shared it with just a handful of favored friends. And I wrote to John Adams about that effort in 1813. We must reduce our volume to the simple evangelists. Select even from them the very words only of Jesus. There will be found remaining the most sublime and benevolent code of morals which has ever been offered to man. I have performed this operation for my own use by cutting verse by verse out of the printed books and arranging the matter which is evidently his and which is as easily distinguishable as diamonds in a dunghill. The result is 46 pages of pure and unsophisticated doctrines, such as were professed and acted upon by the unlettered apostles, the apostolic fathers, and the Christians of the first century. An educated citizenry and the proper distribution of the news were essential for maintaining our republic. And I wrote to Edward Carrington in 1787, the basis of our governments being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate in a moment to prefer the latter. But I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. Were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate for a moment to prefer the latter. In 1815, Congress purchased my personal library to replace the one that had been burned by the British in Mr. Madison's war. It was to become the foundation for a new national library. I had spent a half century collecting those books. It was the choicest library in the United States. When the last of 10 wagon loads rolled down the hill from Monticello in May of 1815 on their way to Washington City, I immediately began acquiring more volumes. Days later, I wrote to my old friend John Adams, I cannot live without books. I cannot live without books. I feared nothing more than the concentration or consolidation of all the nation's powers in the nation's capital. And I wrote to Joseph Cabell in February 1816 as follows. The way to have good and safe government is not to trust it all to one, but to divide it among the many. Let the national government be entrusted with the defense of the nation the state governments with the civil rights, laws, and police, the counties with local concerns, and each ward direct the interests within itself. It is by the dividing and subdividing of these republics from the great national one down through all its subordinations until it ends in the administration of every man's farm by himself. What has destroyed the liberty and the rights of man in every government which has ever existed under the sun? 
It is the generalizing and concentrating of all cares and powers into one body. I loved all things agricultural, and I loved one aspect of agriculture the best, and I wrote to my old friend Charles Wilson Peel in my retirement. I have often thought that if heaven had given me choice of my position and calling, it should have been on a rich spot of earth, well watered, and near a good market for the productions of the garden. No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth, and no culture comparable to that of the gardener. I am still devoted to the garden, but though an old man, I am but a young gardener. I directed the education of my grandchildren, and especially of my oldest grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. We called him Jeff. And when he was 16, I wrote to him in 1808 about how people should conduct themselves in the public realm in stating prudential rules for our government in society, I must not omit the important one of never entering into dispute or argument with another. I never saw an instance of one of two disputants convincing the other by argument. When I hear another express an opinion which is not mine, I say to myself, he has a right to his opinion as I to mine, why should I question it? If he wants information, he will ask it, and then I will give it in measured terms.